book of Acts reminds us that the early church was dynamic. When they were dispersed to other regions by religious persecution, the followers of Christ brought with them the gospel. Consequently, the name of Christ spread like wildfire. Stephen's martyrdom, the conversions of Saul and Cornelius, and the founding of the Church of Antioch, where the believers were first called Christians, ushered in the growth of Gentile missions. The second half of the book of Acts is focused primarily on Paul's missionary journeys. A Bible scholar observes that Paul was like a hunted deer, leaving tracts of blood as he moved from one region to another, proclaiming the gospel of Christ. Yet, Paul says, In our affliction, I am overflowing with joy. Saul the persecutor, who became Paul the apostle, finds joy in bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Paul, his partners, and co-laborers in the Lord's work were moved by the Holy Spirit to preach, teach, heal, demonstrate God's love in synagogues, schools, homes, marketplaces, courtrooms, streets, and wherever God leads them to call people to Christ. As we live in the last days of spiritual deception, secularism, persecution, and apostasy, what have we become as people of God? Have we become complacent, or have we remained dynamic and explosive as the early church? As the bride of Christ, are we still faithful to and in Him? Okay. Can you greet each other? Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Jubilee. Indeed, uh, we're almost over uh, with year 2023. Ambilis, no? So, parang kailan lang. Okay, this morning we're going to talk about the gospel trials. Uh, we started with this series, of course, uh, from the book of Acts earlier this year. And we look at Acts 2, 1 to 6. And what does Acts 2, 1 to 6 say? When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. And as the Spirit enabled them, as, as the Spirit enabled them, now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because they heard their own language. God was preparing His apostles at time in Acts 2, to share the gospel. Of course, the empowerment of the Holy Spirit was for them to speak in different tongues so that other people can understand the gospel. We, God is also preparing us to share the gospel even today. The hope of our nation. The hope for the nations and for the world to receive the gospel. John Dennis, in his book, Christ Plus City, mentions that our faith is a faith for all. Paul's famous words, in Romans 1, 16, delivered a succinct knowledge that, um, that our salvation is not based on human sufficiency. But of course, it's based on the grace of God. There's a saying by um, Boyd Bailey, the quality of our lives is influenced by the quality of our relationships. And if you notice the, our reading this morning, there are relationships being formed, even during the time of Paul, those relationships can affect uh, 
each other, right? So when we talk about are, are, are we connected to the church, is the church um, affecting us in a good way? Is Jubilee affecting you in a good way? So in a sense, when you look at the accounts of the apostles in the book of Acts, you realize that each person, including uh, Felix, the governor, even Festus, even Agrippa, these characters we're going to talk about this morning, or even the Apostle Paul, each of them are affected by the relationships that is surrounding them. Romans 1, 14 to 16 says, it provides an original yet revolutionary way of thinking of race or ethnicity. It seems strange as the book of Romans, as Paul would write it uh, to the Roman Christians, it's a theological treatise, right? But why would Paul introduce ethnicity or class here? Because Paul says that the gospel is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now notice the sequence, to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Priority is given to the Jews since historically God called Abraham first, right? And the promise to Abraham by his seed, all the nations will be blessed. And then Jesus went to the first to the Jews, the 12 apostles, and then Paul went to the Jewish synagogue. So that's the reference here. And then, of course, ethnicity or class. As Paul tells, he wants to go to Rome. He says, I am under obligation both to Greeks, to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. And he wrote this in Romans 1, 14 to 15. So that is the intention here. And when you're looking at the passage once again, uh, basically what Christ is telling us this morning is to really go out of our comfort zones and to enter the world of missions. This month, November, is our month of missions. And when you think about missions, what does it mean, mean for us to be connected uh, to a world where there's a lot of disconnections? Um, how are we in terms of sharing the gospel and making disciples? Of course, it has to start with your own culture. In our culture here at Jubilee, we're predominantly Chinese-Filipino, as you know. And then, of course, we have other races. But how do we now connect with each other? Um, I think last Sunday, we had a fellowship feast, right? Wherein we want our people to gather for lunch and to get to know our different ministries. And we also have the giftedness seminar wherein we can discover our different gifts and how to maximize our giftedness for the glory of God and to be a blessing to others as well. So the quality of our lives is influenced by the quality of our relationships. Can we increase the quality of our lives and our relationships? And today is in our message context, which we just finished with Acts 24 with Reverend Lou uh, last week. It talks about the bumpy ride of Paul and his companions as they preach the gospel throughout, of course, the Roman Empire in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey. At the, ta- at the time, even the trial of Paul with Felix, uh, Felix, I, I usually call him Felix the Cat, <laughs> but it's just uh, for me to remember, but we know it's not Felix the cat, but Antonius Felix, the procurator or governor of Judea. We see here the different characters of people relating with Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul was consistent with his calling and conviction that is to proclaim the gospel faithfully even in the midst of opposition and persecution. Now, when Festus, who is the successor of Felix, came along, to become governor, uh, this is where we see ourselves in Acts 25. So Acts 24 ended with the transition from the governorship of Antonius Felix to Portius Festus. Okay, these are the historical names. Felix was undoubtedly a bad man, according to history, uh, because Festus was a better uh, governor. 
in that sense. He governed well, Festus did, despite all the problems left him by Felix. So the first thing that characterizes the gospel of Christ, in which Paul is sharing in the, in the book of Acts, in the Roman Empire, is this. The gospel of Christ will be opposed this side of heaven. And as we do missions, as we share the gospel, we will face opposition. In the passage we read earlier, right, Festus was in Jerusalem. He was talking to the chief priests and the Jewish leaders who appeared before him and presenting charges against the Apostle Paul. Of course, at this time, uh, Paul is being, uh, I mean, Paul was left in Caesarea in prison by Felix, and it was already two years. Uh, There was a delay of the trial, but again, the Jewish leaders are still uh, decided, okay, on on persecuting or, you know, uh, they want to kill uh, the Apostle Paul. And this is found in the next verse, and you can see it on the screen, which is the map. And the map says the territory of Herod Agrippa. So during this time, you have a king, a Jewish king, but we know that Agrippa's background, he's also Edomian. So there's a mix of uh, race as well. Can we go to the next slide, please? So they requested Festus as a favor to have Paul transferred to Jerusalem from Caesarea, for they were preparing an ambush to kill him along the way. So the intention to kill Rome, uh, kill Paul was still there, okay? And then... Festus answered, Paul is being held at Caesarea, and I myself am going there, okay? So let some of your leaders come with me, and if the man has done anything wrong, they can press charges against him there. So that's the tension of the story. There is a trial, and there needs to be a verdict for the Apostle Paul. The religious leaders hope to make Paul appear before them again in Jerusalem, that Festus would summon Paul to Jerusalem while they lay in ambush along the road to kill him. The religious leaders knew that Paul would be acquitted in any fair trial. Therefore, they didn't really want Paul to be put on trial again in Jerusalem. They, they want to ambush and murder him before the trial could take place. We see a growth of corruption, okay? In Acts 23, where the plot to murder Paul was first launched, we find that it was the zealots who were responsible. And I think uh, Pastor Jay mentioned that already a few weeks. Now in Acts 25, the leaders are doing the same thing, the plot to murder Paul again. But Festus refuses to put Paul on trial again in Jerusalem. Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea and that he himself was going there shortly. Therefore, he said, let those who have authority among you go there and charge him there so that they can resolve the matter. Now, we come to the second thing about this gospel trial, okay, about the gospel. The gospel of Christ makes us blameless and truthful. This is the second thing. If the first thing is the gospel of Christ, um, we face all kinds of opposition and persecution, right, oppose would oppose us this side of heaven. This is the second thing. After spending eight or ten days with them, Festus went down to Caesarea. Now, why is it down? Because Jerusalem is a more an elevated, right, on a hill, going down to Caesarea, which is by the sea. And next day, he convened the court, ordered that Paul be brought before him. And when Paul came in, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him, and they can, you can just imagine the scene, right? They brought many serious charges against him, but they could not prove them, right? Then Paul made his defense. I have done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. So now you see a clash of different cultures here, right? The Jewish culture, which conveys the importance of the temple, right? And then, of course, Caesar Uh, the emperor of Rome. Paul, in one of his letters, he he writes this, and he is emphasizing this, and not only for the Christians back then in in, in the city of Corinth, right? 
but it's also for us. It says here in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 to 9, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, of the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Wonderful truth about the resurrection, that even in the midst of opposition or persecution, Paul stood his ground, right? That he knew that the Lord will deliver him time and time again, and that if his time is up, right, he's going to face death. But he know that death has no final say because we believe in the resurrection as Christians. That we don't rely on ourselves anymore, but we rely on the power of God through the power of resurrection. That God raises the dead. Right? And then Paul continues to write to them. He has delivered us from such deadly peril and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on your behalf, on our behalf, for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. Now, going back to the story in Acts 25, we look at this next uh, few verses, okay? So 9 and 10 says, okay, Festus wishing to do the Jews a favor, being a politician, right? said to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Paul answered, I am now standing before Caesar's court where I ought to be tried. I have not done any wrong to the Jews as you yourself know very well. So Paul is defending himself. He appealed to the highest authority at the time who of the Roman Empire is Caesar, right? Caesar is the title like Pharaoh, right? Or king or emperor. And Paul's argument is this one. If however I am guilty of doing anything deserving death, I do not refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by the Jews, by these Jews are not true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his council, he declared, You appealed, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. And we are about to end this series in the book of Acts. And the end story is that, Caesar, uh, that Paul will face Caesar. In this scene here, okay, Paul, this is an artist's rendition. Paul is making his defense. Of course, in this scene, you have the next scene, which is Agrippa. Because Festus now, uh, being uh, the governor, he calls on King Agrippa, which is the king of the Jews, to have this trial. But it, this trial was held in Caesarea. Okay? Now, just a quick background. Who is King Agrippa? Okay? King Agrippa, he's called Agrippa II. Okay, born around 27 or 28 um, AD, okay, or CE. He was a Roman client king who sided with Rome against his Jewish countrymen during the first Jewish war of 66 and 73 AD. The son of Agrippa I, he was the seventh and last king of the family of Herod the Great. Now, if you notice a few Sundays ago, uh, Revlu showed the family tree, right? And then Agrippa II's full name is like that of his father, Marcus Julius Agrippa. He's sometimes called Herod Agrippa II. Educated in Rome, Agrippa was thoughtfully, uh, thoroughly Hellenistic, a Hellenistic Jew, meaning Jewish uh, by blood, but grew up with the Greek culture. After his father died, then when Agrippa was still a teenager, Emperor Claudius gradually provided him with territorial political responsibilities, including the right to name the important post of the high priest of Jerusalem. So you see there, there's, no, there's an influence of the state to the religion of the Jews. Agrippa also found favor with Nero, 
the emperor during that time, who increased his territories significantly. In the New Testament, Agrippa II is remembered as the Jewish king who heard the preaching of St. Paul. And we will see this in the next scene, right? Agrippa had grown increasingly unpopular in Jewish religious circles for his Hellenistic lifestyle. He alleges, allegedly abused his authority in regard to the high priesthood and his general insensitivity toward Jewish religious issues. And of course, rumors he was living in with an incestuous relationship with his sister Bernice. As tensions built toward war, Agrippa attempted to convince his fellow Jews not to revolt. In the end, he and his sister Bernice was expelled from Jerusalem and sided with Rome. So that's basically the historical backdrop of where we are in Acts 25. Now we go back to the story. Let's go to the next scene. So Festus consults King Agrippa. A few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrive at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus, the governor. Since they were spending many days there, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. And he said, there is a man here whom Felix left as a prisoner. Then when I went to Jerusalem, the chief priests, the elders of the Jews, brought charges against him and asked that he be condemned. So we already know this, right? And so if you look at the timeline, okay, just quickly, during King Agrippa's second rule, the Apostle Paul was engaged in a missionary journey. He was traveling. His teaching about Jesus Christ spread throughout the Roman Empire. The salvation that was accepted by many, and of course there was persecution. But he also quite, he gathered quite a number of enemies. When the opponents of Paul's preaching, okay, incited a citywide riot in Jerusalem, Acts 21, Paul was arrested by the Roman commander in charge of the city, not knowing that what to do with the Roman citizen who had the ability to incite so much anger among the Jews. The commander brought him before the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews, and the priests conspired to kill Paul. Sounds very familiar, right? Because it happened to our Lord Jesus. But the Roman commander got wind of the plot and had Paul safely transferred to Caesarea, Acts 23. Here, the Jewish leaders secured a lawyer named Tertullus, Acts 24, and accused Paul before the Roman governor, Felix, to appease the Jews. And Felix has to imprison Paul. After two years in prison, Paul was brought before Festus, now Felix's successor, we come to Acts 25, and Paul appealed to the emperor, Caesar, and Festus reluctantly gave the verdict, intending to send Paul to Rome. So to Caesar you will go. A few days later, King Agrippa II and his sister went to see uh, Festus, and they hear about Paul's defense. Okay, and then this is the next uh, verse. Uh, this is between Festus consulting with King Agrippa. Festus says, I told them that it's not the Roman custom to hand over anyone before they have faced their accusers and have an opportunity to defend themselves against the charges. When they came here with me, I did not delay the case, okay, but convened in the court the next day and ordered the man to be brought in. When his accusers got up to speak, they did not charge him with any of the crimes I had expected. Instead, they had some points of disputes with him about their own religion and about the dead man named Jesus, who Paul claimed was alive. I was at a loss how to investigate such matters. So I asked if he would be willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial there on these charges. But when Paul made his appeal to be held over for the emperor's decision, I ordered him held until I could send him to Caesar. This is basically a fulfillment of God's commission of Paul, even in the road to Damascus, telling that he will become an apostle to the Gentiles. And it's the last uh, leg of the life of the Apostle Paul. So the last leg of the life of Apostle Paul is to face Caesar 
the king, right, the emperor of the whole Roman Empire, to preach the gospel to him. Along the way, he was preaching the gospel already. And people believed in the gospel, repented of their sins, believed in the power of the resurrection, and now they have the hope, the hope that doesn't disappoint. And this same hope is the hope that we share uh, to you as well. The hope of the resurrection that is found in Jesus Christ. That one should put your faith in the Lord Jesus and repent of your sins, okay? You will be changed. There's a change, transformation of the heart, of the mind, and now you live a new life in the Lord. So now, that's the tension. And you can feel the tension as you read it, okay? And then, of course, this is Festus talking to Agrippa. The next verses would be Agrippa's reply. Okay, what did Agrippa say? Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear this man myself, he replied. Tomorrow you will hear him. The next day Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the audience room with the high-ranking military officers. Prominent men of the city at the command of Festus, Paul was brought in. Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are present with us, you see this man. The whole Jewish community was petitioned me about him in Jerusalem here in Caesarea, shouting that he ought not to live any longer. I found he had done nothing, the serving of death. Next slide, please. But because he made his appeal to the emperor, I decided to send him to Rome. But I have nothing definite to write to his majesty about him. Therefore, I brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that as a result of this investigation, I may have something to write. For I think it is unreasonable to send a prisoner to, on to Rome without specifying the charges against him. So this is the scene, right? They were talking about Paul. And it's interesting, what is Paul's stand? And you can read this in his letters. One sample of this letter is found in 2 Corinthians. It says here, We put no stumbling block in anyone's path, according to Paul, so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way, in great endurance, in troubles, in hardships, distresses, in beatings, in imprisonments. Paul experienced all this. Riots, in hard work, sleepless nights, hunger, Purity, understanding, patience, kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and in sincere love. What a tone of Paul's voice. Look at verse 7. In truthful speech, and in the power of God, in the weapons of righteousness, in the hand, in the right hand, in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report, good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten, and yet not killed, sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, poor, yet making many rich, having nothing, yet possessing everything. You see the contrast in the language of the Apostle Paul. And as a follower of Christ, and as we follow Jesus, of course, there will be persecutions. Maybe here in the Philippines, we don't face a lot of persecutions, but in other countries, right? Uh, we hear stories from uh, Manipur, India, Pakistan, right? Uh, Christians being persecuted because of their faith. So, Paul's desire is that for all the people in the Roman Empire, and this letter extends to us today, we are to know God's will in our lives. We are to walk worthily of the Lord. We are to bear good works. We are to know increase in the knowledge of God. And of course, in all these things, uh, even Paul, as he stands, in the gospel trial, we come to the third thing that characterizes the gospel of Christ. And this means the gospel of Christ is proclaimed to the Gentiles. It's also our mission. It's our life's mission, similar to Paul. Verse 19, So then King Agrippa I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven. This is what Paul was saying in his defense. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and then to the Gentiles. I preached that they should repent 
and turn to God and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day, so I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. Notice the words of Paul, a light to his own people and then to the Gentiles. Christmas is around the corner and we celebrate uh, that light. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You are out of your mind, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. Paul replied, I am not insane, most excellent Festus. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things. Talking about King Agrippa, right? And I can speak freely to him. I am convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade, pers persuade me to be a Christian? Now notice, Agrippa knew the word Christian. He heard about it in Antioch. And Paul replied, Short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. The king rose, and with him the governor and, Ber and Bernice, and those sitting with them. After they left the room, they began saying to one another, This man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. And Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Wonderful that even in Paul's defense, he would mention the power of the resurrection, that Christ was raised from the dead, that because of the power of the resurrection, many people's lives were changed. People believe in the gospel. And even when the gospel is being tried, okay, in the presence of, of these governors, of this king, Paul stood firm in his conviction, right? So in conclusion, in these two chapters, Acts 25 and 26, okay, we have three things that characterizes the gospel of Christ. First thing is the gospel of Christ will be opposed this side of heaven. Paul experiences it, and we can experience it as well. The second thing that characterizes the gospel of Christ is that it makes us blameless and truthful. And similar to Paul's life, there was, there was a change in his life, transformation, right? From, from a persecutor to a persecuted. And now... And the third thing that characterizes the gospel of Christ is that it is proclaimed to the Gentiles, and it is our life's mission. Three things, right? Of course, the question now is how then should we live after hearing this message, right, for today? Let me just summarize it this way, but it's, it's a way of how to understand both chapters, right? So live and proclaim the gospel of Christ faithfully so people will hear and repent. So hearing of the gospel is very important as we share the gospel. So with that in mind, I would close this in a word of prayer. And I hope that because of this message for us, we continue to share the gospel even in the midst of opposition or maybe persecution on our part. But we are to be faithful uh, to the end. Let's pray. Lord, help us uh, to share your gospel. Of course, we have many means to do that. Uh, we can uh, share a gospel tract. We can post uh, Bible verses, maybe in our Instagram or Facebook for our friends. We can be trained in how to share the gospel. We can be involved in missions through going ourselves, through giving, or even a training of missionaries and pastors to preach the gospel. And Lord, indeed, it is a great task. And thank you, Lord, for choosing us from darkness into your marvelous light, that as we share your gospel with boldness like Paul, 
that even in the midst of the gospel trials, we understand people are opposed to this message because it's, it is not an easy message to hear because it is a message of repentance. So help us, O oh God, as a church, to continue to preach the good news because people need to hear it and people need to respond by faith in repentance to believe in the power of the resurrection that it can truly transform our lives and give us hope, the hope that does not disappoint. Lord, many times in our lives, we are faced with all kinds of challenges and things that worry us. And yet the solution for most of our worries is found in the gospel because once we live out this gospel, things change in our lives. We become more truthful, become more compassionate, become more gracious, become more understanding, O oh God. So Lord, help us as a church to continue to trust you, even in the daily challenges that we face. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.